Hey friends, this is Ben again. I'm recording a quick video uh, for preparation for assignment two stuff. Um, this is not a high quality video amongst other things. Notice that the uh, quality is super grainy here. That's because the white level is kind of low. I just do not feel like uh, going and getting a special lamp in order to get the light level up and so forth. I've been fighting with dogs. My furnace is, <clears throat> my furnace is broken. It's been a day. So this is just not going to be a great video. Sorry. <clears throat> so the thing that we're looking at on this assignment is dealing with vector valued functions. If you have previously dealt with parameterized functions, that's all this is. The vector valued functions just have an R vector of T is equal to, and then for each of the coordinate entries, it has a different function. Okay. So uh, we're going to take a quick look at an example where we're graphing something uh, using a couple of different options. First, uh, the first option is going to be doing it with collab. I have gone ahead and done this ahead of time. I know some people have expressed that they kind of like to see the thought process. I just don't have the, have the energy to recreate it. So I'm just going to show you what I did in the first place here. So here at this collab, um, I think all of y'all have dealt with collab. If, if you haven't, if you haven't, I don't know what to tell you. Okay. So, uh, with this collab document I've got here, I have imported NumPy. NumPy is the numerical Python schemes. And I, I gave it the name NP because sometimes I'll have to re reference it to God knows what. Then I went ahead and said from NumPy to import pi, sine, and cosine. Because I'm going to use those all over the damn place and I don't want to have to type them over and over again. And so... And then I went ahead and imported the plotting package and referred to it as PLT. And that's because who knows what kind of parameters I may have to change on some, some damn plot. So uh, something to keep in mind when you're doing these plots is Google it if you don't know how to do something. And you can literally just say, uh, say uh, Python and tell it what you want to do. And it'll probably turn you up code to do it. Google has a really good resource on this. Okay. So the thing that I'm plotting here, this X equals T minus cosine T and Y equals sine T uh, would just be a vector valued function where you've got a vector sign T minus cosine T comma sine T. Okay. And the plot of it that you can see down here, uh, it is... I don't remember whether it's an epicycloid or a hypocycloid or some, something like this. Uh, it's got a special name to it. It just kind of rolls along here okay, and makes these arches. And so the problem I'm looking to solve in this is to get an idea of <clears throat> where the arch is at, the maximum spot there that's closest to the origin. Okay. So the origin would be right about here. And so we're looking for this spot here. Now from the graph, it looks like that spot is going to be about, I don't know, two comma one or something. And, but we're looking to get a better idea than just getting a guess like that. So the way we tackle it using calculus is that we notice that when we are at the top of that arch that we must be having a maximum for our y values. When do maximums occur? At critical points. So we take the derivative of our y, and the y is just sine t, so the derivative of it's just cosine t. <clears throat> Set that cosine t equal to zero. And, oh, I should not have done that. Set that to cosine t equal to zero and solve and that will happen where the t is equal to pi over 2. So plugging the pi over 2 back in, the x value that you get 
is going to then just be pi over two, which is about 1.571. And that says that that two that I was estimating was a really crappy estimate, okay? And then the Y value that I get does turn out to be one. So, so the maximum nearest the origin is gonna be at pi over two comma one. So um, that's serving to show you some of what's going on with these vector valued functions that uh, when you talk about the derivatives and stuff, uh, you can reference back to the things in Calc 1 and talk about the derivatives of the X or Y value in order to find maximums or minimums um, and, and stuff like that, okay? All right, then we're gonna take a look at another example here. And in this one, we are thinking about um, projectile motion. So your projectile motion, the parameterization for it is given in this sort of formulation here. The x coordinates, you've got your v naught, that's your initial velocity, times the cosine of theta, the theta being the angle above the horizontal that your projectile is being fired at, and then times t. And then your y value will have an h added in there, which will have to do with the height above the ground that you're firing your projectile. And then we will have a minus one half of gt squared depending on what units that you've got things in, um, your value for G will, will change. Because uh, people who are doing things with the sciences are usually using metric measurements, we're gonna go ahead and use 9.8. If you're looking in the textbook, I don't know why mathematicians insist on doing this, but most calculus books just insist on putting the old uh, imperial units in there where the G is 32. You just have to deal with that, okay? But here I've just made up a quick example where I made that my uh, G, and that means the height above the ground being 1.25 meters. Um, thinking about that, that's that would be if you were throwing a baseball or something, uh, 1.25 meters seems like a kind of a reasonable area for the ball to be released at. So, and then the velocity being 20 and to make the units match up, that ought to be 20 meters per second. Uh, my physical intuition is not good on, on whether that's a throw, a fast pitch or a slow pitch, so. And I went ahead and said, let's make the theta value be pi over four because pi over four is uh, a pretty good angle to get a, a good distance in there. Now, one thing that we find out, it seems like since uh, with one of the problems y'all are gonna do, um, you'll show that when you fire a projectile from ground level, uh, if you want to find an angle that will maximize the range for it, that angle turns out to be pi over four. It seems like that ought to be the angle that you would use all the time. But it turns out that depending on what height you have things, things fired above the ground, you can get a little bit of difference by varying that angle a little bit. So, okay, anyhow though, uh, we're we're going to use that just for our drawing here. And notice that for our drawing, we have to figure out our T values, okay? And I just went zero to four and make a hundred points of it. And that's just, just getting the drawing going there. And then I did the parameterizations for the X and the Y. And then I did a plot here and I use something you may not be used to, the np dot zeros underscore like of x will just produce a bunch of zeros in the same shape as the x uh, vector is, or the x variable is. But then we've got our plot here. And so if we take a look down here, the blue plot is the level ground 
and the orange plot is going to be the parabolic path that your projectile goes along. And we're kind of looking here to just get some kind of a guesstimate about where it hits at. Okay. So it looks like it's probably around 40 or 45, you know. So then maybe we want to get a more exact answer on that. So I am going to share with you from the iPad now. And see how that goes. Boom. All right, good deal. All right, hopefully that's big enough to read there. So the notion that I have is that we've got our projectile that's going to hit the ground. So we take the y coordinate, set it equal to zero, and solve. Just use the good old quadratic formula to do that. And once you do, you should be able to end up with a formulation like that right there. Now that, uh, you notice I've got a plus and minus above, but then after I divide by the negative, it turns into a minus plus. Doesn't really matter, but sometimes you have formulas where you have to match these sorts of things up. So that's why I have the minus plus written like that. We, of course, <clears throat> uh, when we want to deal with this, really can't be talking about the minus. The reason for that is if you look at what's under the square root here, this 2gh is going to be positive. And that means that the whole thing under the square root is going to be a little bit more than, um, than I'm sorry, the, the whole thing after you take a square root is going to be a little bit more than v naught sine theta. So that being the case, then um, if you take and subtract, you'll get a negative value for your t. And I wrote the word range out there. Why the hell did I write the word range? <coughs> That's a, um, just the wrong thing. So, um, so I should have... taking care of that right there. Okay, so uh, once we've got that for our t value, then yeah, I should go ahead and write the t out here. And um, we're gonna plug that back in because we're talking about range. If you remember your x was gonna be Gosh, I have, have kind of forgotten what it was going to be. Um, was it V naught cosine theta uh, times the T? And because we just found out that the T is going to be this bit here, we can say 1 over G V naught sine theta plus square root V naught squared sine squared theta plus 2gh. Okay, and so we can simplify that a little bit and have, let's see, v naught squared cosine theta sine theta over g and plus um, v naught cosine theta over g times the square root v naught squared sine squared theta plus 2gh. That's pretty nasty, right? But the idea about this is that if we're talking about x as a function of theta and we want to figure out the theta that's going to maximize this, then what we can do is to find dx d theta, or I'll just write x prime of theta, and set it equal to zero and solve. So again, that uh, looks to be kind of a mess, right? 
But if things are a little bit nicer, if say for instance, H was equal to zero, then you're gonna actually have something that's not too bad to work with. If the H is equal to zero, that square root will end up uh, turning this into uh, two times V naught squared cosine theta sine theta, right? All that over G. And then when you take your derivative, you can apply either apply the product rule or you could uh, have taken advantage of the fact that uh, two cosine theta sine theta is actually the sine of two theta. Either way you go at it, you take a derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for theta, and you end up with that pi over four, okay? However, if it's not got the h equal to zero, then you get something that's a little bit different. But it's kind of a mess. So um, <clears throat> if you were needing to deal with this and you didn't need to be super exact on things, you could take a look at a graph and look and see where that, uh, that function that you've got. Look, uh, you could plug in values for V naught uh, in V naught and H in this and look and see approximately where uh, you're getting a maximum at. So, all right. <clears throat> so that gives you a little bit of an idea there of uh, some of what you're doing. Um, yeah. Uh, the, this assignment number two is going to be considerably shorter than assignment number one. It's got uh, a little more maybe to think about and trying to do these maximums and minimums though. So uh, do the reading, see what you get into there. And additionally, if you haven't gotten everything figured out for assignment number one, take a little bit more time to finish that up, okay? I have the feeling I kind of pressed y'all a little too much on day one, and then I'm maybe <laughs> not having enough stuff on day two. But we'll see how things go, all right? All right, uh, talk to y'all later.